So as an author, frequent speaker, and chief technology officer, Nelson helps to shape the development of TIPCO technology platforms and products. With over 20 years experience, he draws upon his deep knowledge of APIs, cloud, and event-driven architectures, analytical applications, and other innovation areas to advise on information creation and delivery patterns. And right now, he's going to tell us why events are cool. So over to you, Nelson. All right, perfect. Thanks, Dan. Hopefully, I've done everything correctly and everyone can hear me fine. So just to uh, just as Dan mentioned, I am going to talk to you about events and why they're cool again. Uh, for anybody that's been around the, uh, the industry for quite some time, um, events are not necessarily a new concept, but they're definitely getting a lot of attention. And so I'm here to talk a little bit about what they are, why they're important again, and also talk about some architectural patterns and paradigms that do leverage events uh, in different architectures. So just one, one quick slide on who I am. I am a, uh, the CTO of TIPCO, as Dan mentioned. Uh, we uh, are a software company that's been around for a number of years, 25 plus years. Uh, we really focus on sort of three core capabilities. And this is our ability to connect to data, move data, unify data in a number of different ways, and also apply AI ML against that data. So as you can imagine, as we go through our customers and the work that we do with those customers, events are a very important aspect of what it is that we do. And a large part of that reason is just because of the way in which people are looking to build applications. Right? People are really focused on building the next generation of digital applications in ways that really embrace new features, new functions, new capabilities, such as APIs, such as microservices, of course, embracing AI ML into those services, making sure that we can deploy them anywhere or anywhere and everywhere, as I often call it. So it might be on premise, it might be in a private cloud platform, it might be in public cloud infrastructure. And then of course, there is now this trend or almost a, a re-emergence, if you will, of building systems that are very event driven. As I mentioned, we almost go through these different cycles in the world um, in terms of the technology and the patterns that we use and some of these things. Um, maybe the buzzwords change, but in some ways what we do still is, uh, is very relevant and very consistent with what we've done in the past. Um, we're just, of course, doing it using new technologies and new ways of approaching some of these problems. So people are looking to build these very modern applications using the technology stacks, of course, that we have available to us today. And you know, we're doing that, of course, in a, a different context or a series of different contexts from what we did in the past. It used to be that we would build service-oriented architectures and we would talk a lot about event uh, service buses and, and these kinds of things. Well, that, that world has definitely changed. So now the conversation is more around things like serverless or function as a service architectures, um, pushing compute capabilities out to the edge, um, incorporating things like IoT, using capabilities such as service meshes to support the deployment of my overall microservices-based architectures, um, including analytics now in these processes. So if I'm publishing or producing these events or su subscribing or consuming these events, I of course want to include now analytics into that processing. And again, that could be in an edge, private or public cloud context or often all of the above. APIs are obviously a part of this, but APIs are not just request reply anymore. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, there's other patterns or almost the reemergence of patterns that we need to apply. So this is things like sagas, event sourcing, CQRS, and so on. And again, we're gonna to touch upon that as well. We wanna be able to access information regardless of where it sits. We need to do so with a greater degree of speed and frequency. We wanna make sure that the APIs that I am building are incorporating event-driven concepts where it makes sense. It's not always a mandatory requirement. Again, we wanna do that any, anywhere and everywhere. Um, and finally, the one on the left that I uh, kind of passed over to let it crash, that's often my, my code, I guess. Um, but the idea here is that we need to make sure that we're, when we're building systems, that we're leveraging things like containers and container management systems and so on, just to quickly recover from any problems or errors or, or challenges, if you will, that our code or that our software might, uh, might write into. So the modern application is really being powered by events. And a large part of that reason is that traditional data processing simply is not sufficient, right? If my, my traditional process of taking events, storing that into a data store, then like a data lake or something along those lines, then analyzing those events and then generating actions like a, a cross-sell, upsell opportunity as an example, this process 
just takes too long. Now, I'm not saying we're not gonna do this because we are still going to have our data lakes and our data marts, and we're gonna set up enterprise data fabrics. We're gonna have the, the notion of bounded business context, not just applied to microservices, but also to data. Right? Those things are still going to exist, but we need to, in some ways, leverage an event driven architecture to augment what it is that we've done in the past. Right. So, and the reason is really around what I call decision latency. So the time between when I collect those events, store them, analyze them, generate actions, then take action. By that time, the customer has left the point of sale device. The fraud has already occurred. The piece of equipment has already broken, right? Uh, I'm not really utilizing the IOT data to predict when the piece of equipment might fail. So you're just introducing too much decision latency into certain types of business processes. And again, we're not eliminating this completely, but we need to take a look at our architectures and the solutions that we're building and see where it makes sense to power our next generation applications with events. And so that's a large part of what we often look at. Um, you know, we often look at, well, so what, what exactly, first of all, is an event, right? So if I'm saying that we need to drive a lot of our architectures um, with events, well, first of all, how do we define an event? What is that to us? And in many ways, what I typically talk about is that events really represent the way that the world works, right? The world is not perfect. The world does not happen in an orderly fashion. Um, not everything is sequenced nicely. Um, you may even run into situations where things don't even happen at all, right? The, the problem around a missing event. And so I often talk about just events representing the way that the world works. It often represents some sort of uh, change of state, right? So it is a... Uh, a, a purchase that has a purchase order, right? Not, not, and uh, we'll talk about the difference between a command and event, um, but an event is the fact that something has been purchased or a customer or passenger has been checked in or a patient has been uh, ad admitted, right? Those are the kinds of things that events can represent, right? It's some sort of change of state in a key business data element. And this is really true regardless of the vertical that you're in whether you're in government, healthcare, logistics, transportation, manufacturing, all, you know, all these different verticals, events can be found anywhere. So they are really a key element of the value that the business is providing. They can also come from any place at any time in any order. As I mentioned, the world does not happen or does not act in a nice, orderly, sequential sort of fashion. Um, events are gonna happen at any time in any order. And of course, the systems that we're building, since they're very distributed, it means that an event, when it is triggered, may actually not arrive to your decision-making engine, if you will, um, in a timely fashion because of some network issue or some other challenge, if you will, in terms of how that event is being transported. Uh, you may actually not get that event in time to make a decision. So you have to take those sorts of things into account. Right, so they can come from any place, any time, in any order, but sometimes they don't even come at all. And in many cases, the missing events are the ones that are more important. Right. Those are the ones that you want to respond to, not the fact that events are occurring uh, in, in terms of what you deem to be the happy path. You have to treat events with the same importance as data. Right? Events should be first class citizens. Events are not an afterthought. So data now is becoming a critical aspect, of course, of what most organizations are focused on. Right? Microservices are there to augment a lot of the business functions around the data. AIML is meant to actually analyze the information that's being collected in terms of uh, the, or by the organization around the data again, right? Those are the kinds of things that um, are very critical to organizations. Events have to be treated also with the same level of, of criticality. So they're almost a mandatory component of today's enterprise architectures, right? You need to consider this up front. You don't look at it afterwards. Um, you actually really need to think about where events are going to fit if they do fit. And again, they're not, you're not gonna use them everywhere. They're not some magic answer to every single business problem, but you need to look at where they're gonna fit and how you're gonna apply them. So the modern application these days are really powered by events and the events are there to help you reduce decision latency. And as I mentioned, regardless of vertical, there's a number of different use cases that can really be facilitated by the power of events. And again, whether that's things like patient outcomes, whether that's fraud detection, inventory management, telecommunications, all these things can be actually driven by events. So what does this look like? And here's a, a traditional, if you will, request response interaction. So I have an application, it invokes an API, the API does some stuff on the back end. maybe I've got different layers and so on and so forth, different services that are being invoked, maybe I've got different assemblies of different APIs, maybe it's REST, maybe it's GraphQL, 
all of that is fine. You just got an application that's getting a request and then getting back an answer, right? Your, your stereotypical request response interaction. And again, I'm not saying that we're replacing this. I'm just going to talk about how we may want to enrich or change or augment some of these types of interactions. Because in certain types of use cases, there's some challenges with these sort of interactions, right? It's very client driven, it's synchronous. You really have a uh, sort of a limited support for things like streaming real time event driven data. It's more point to point in certain ways. Uh, it's hard to difficult and, and potentially difficult to scale this to a large number of endpoints. So if you look at things like IoT, you're not gonna ping every single IoT device that you've deployed to see what the current state of that IoT device is. So these are the kinds of things that may indicate that it's really not a, a proper use of a, a pattern, right? The request response pattern in this particular context. So alternatively, you can look at employing more of an event-driven pattern, right? Where some application is generating an event, an event is typically in response to a command. So a command might be purchase something and the event is something was purchased, right? So there's a, a slight distinguish uh, distinction there between the two concepts. But you've got this idea of an event that's being produced by a service somewhere in your organization, and it gets pushed to some sort of mechanism, which is then gonna transport that event to anybody that cares about it. Right? And the anybody that cares about it, you don't know who they are necessarily up front, nor do you actually really care. You're just gonna say, here's an event that says something was purchased. Whoever cares about something being purchased, I want you to then handle that and take care of it. Right. So it's much more of an event driven pattern triggered by these events and then picked up by other services across your organization and then used as a way to trigger other sorts of business logic. So that's something that was purchased may then decrement inventory in a separate set of microservices. Right. That's the idea. And so here now you've got the notion of it being client or server driven, synchronous or asynchronous, the ability to support streaming data. Um, maybe you're now eliminating the idea of it being very point to point. Um, and so now you're opening up the way in which you can build your architecture and scale uh, your services to be able to respond to these event driven patterns. So that's the idea. And as I mentioned, you're not eliminating one or the other, you're creating combinations thereof. So some services are still gonna make sense to happen synchronously in a request reply driven fashion, and others maybe make more sense to actually happen in an event driven way. And your architecture is likely going to consist of both. Right? And now you're going to use potentially different technologies to implement these patterns, but you're going to have combinations thereof. Um, in some cases, for example, I've got organizations that are building different data domains and the services are supporting those data domains. And the way the domains talk to one another is through the use of events. Right? It's one way to, for them to share information without them being tightly coupled in a point to point fashion. That's just one, one example of where these combinations of patterns can be utilized. And typically this starts with an event contract. So just like with APIs, you might use the open API spec, you might use GraphQL schemas or those kinds of things to define what the API contract is going to look like. You can actually do the same thing with an event, right? You're gonna have some sort of contract that defines this is the interface that I'm going to expose when you're dealing with me in an event driven way. And so the async API specification is one way that you can do that. Now, you don't necessarily have to do it this way, but it is one way, of course, that you can do that. Now, when you look at some of the event-driven patterns, there's a number of different ways that people look at events. So yes, there's this notion of publishing events out, having a number of different applications or services subscribe to those events, but you're also gonna mix in different event patterns in order to augment the way in which you're handling events in your organization. So for example, you may actually set up a pattern that's focused very much on what they call event sourcing, right? So you're collecting the events and you're persisting the events themselves and as opposed to persisting the state, the end state. And the, so for example, this would be um, like a bank balance. And so you're persist, persisting all the different events that act upon that bank balance, but you're not just storing the end balance, right? So the idea there is, if you wanted to replay the events from any point in time to any point in time, you could do so. And you could re then recreate the state of your world um, based upon these events at any, again, at any point in time, right? So you can recreate the bank balance at point 
T minus two or whatever it is, whatever your current time is a couple days ago, you know, those kinds of things, just by replaying back the events. You have a complete history. Now, keep in mind that you also have a complete history of every, every bad event decision that was made. <laughs> You've got that information as well. But think of this as almost like an event record, right? All the events that lead up to a particular state at any point in time. Now, of course, as you're collecting those events and persisting them to build this event source state, you can then actually go ahead and push those events to other services. So for example, you may push these events to a set of other services which are going to uh, store those events in such a way that they can then be optimized for certain types of query capabilities, right? Other applications that do need to present information to an end user, another application and so on, right? So you have this idea of separating the uh, commands from the queries. Right? Here's what's going on behind the scenes to generate the events which are then being sent to some other store, which is then going to facilitate the way in which you want to query the data. And those two stores, if you will, are decoupled again through the use of events. Now I get a lot of questions around, okay, well, if I have a bunch of these microservices and these microservices are all supporting different business transactions, how do I actually understand where a transaction sits, right? A transaction is, is stuck somewhere. How do I know where that is? How do I know in which microservice it sits? How long did every, did every microservice take? What SLAs are there? How do I dynamically assemble microservices together to represent different paths through a microservice? Well, that's really where a lot of sagas can come into play. Again, not a new concept, but sagas are really there to help you coordinate, control, sequence, um, maybe even compensate for errors, all the ways in which a business transaction can span one or more service. And you can have sagas that are very centralized, where a single engine, if you will, is aware of everything that needs to be orchestrated, or these sagas can be purely event-driven. Right? These events happened, here's what needs to happen next. Right? And, and that's more of a choreographed scenario as opposed to a completely orchestrated or centralized scenario. And then finally, I talked about commands, right? You've got actions um, that actually start some form of a processing. So a command, as I mentioned, might be something like, uh, you know, purchase this product, um, whereas the event is product was purchased. Right? So there's a distinction between the two and the way and build your architecture will obviously reflect that. Now, another way in which people look at this is they often will refer to these types of systems as being very reactive. You'll hear the term reactive applications. Uh, there's a website out there, feel free to check it out. It's reactive manifesto, but it's, a, it's an approach to building systems that are very responsive, resilient, message-driven and elastic, right? So very responsive in the sense that it's very event-driven. As soon as something happens, you can respond to it and make, and make some sort of decision. Uh, again, reducing that decision latency. It's very resilient so that if something goes down, you've got other systems or other services or event stores or things like that can, that can then help you recover from those errors. It's again, very message driven. So things are not tightly coupled and it's very elastic. If I wanna add new capabilities, scale existing capabilities, or even just have new subscribers now listen to events that are already being produced, I, I can again do so in a very responsive event driven fashion. Right, so this is just a, another way, another set of um, patterns, if you will, in terms of how you can build systems that are very event driven. Give you a bit of a diagram. So I mentioned things like event sourcing, CQRS. So again, you can imagine a series of clients interacting with microservices, either behind a service mesh or behind some sort of an API gateway management platform or whatever. These services are doing things. Maybe you've got one dealing with inventory, one dealing with purchases, one dealing with customers, and then they're producing events on the back end. Those events are collected. You can derive then, of course, the state of that customer, that inventory of that product, just by replaying those events. And then those events in turn are published so that they can be consumed by other services, which are responsible for aggregating data, maybe for the purposes of analytics or optimizing the way in which you wanna store the data for the purposes of clients and client consumption. Right? So you'll have a lot of these different interactions occurring on the back end, all powered by, again, the, the event contract, the microservices that are implementing those contracts and then the different patterns that you're putting together on the back end. And this is also another way to look at these event patterns. So this is now more focused on, for example, streaming data coming in. So clickstream data, uh, log data, uh, social media feeds, IOT data, whatever that might be. And then you may actually put that data through a series of stages. So for example, you may of course ingest that data 
perform some pre-processing against those events to normalize them. Uh, maybe you want to enrich that data with external metadata around what that IoT device actually is, the manufacturer who made it, where it's located, you know, those kinds of things. You may normalize or transform the events into something that's a little more structured in case it's coming in in some weird and wonderful format. And then you're going to forward those events to some sort of a, let's say, batch layer. Uh, so this is maybe your data lake. This is where you're doing your analytics and so on. And then you may also, of course, in parallel, run that through a real-time layer. Right? So this is where you've operationalized an AI ML model. This is where you're doing your real-time cross-sell, upsell. This is where you're doing your predictive maintenance analysis right, against that inbound event or potentially combinations of events all within a particular time period. And then from here, you're generating outcomes. Right? I need to go and maintain that piece of equipment. I need to actually then deliver an offer to that customer. I need to then stop that fraudulent activity from occurring. Right? These are the outcomes. So events, of course, can be used to drive these types of decisions. And so they can often be parallelized into a batch in real time context. And of course, the batch work that you've done, again, with AI, ML models and so on, is feeding into the real time context. So you can make those decisions in real time. Right? And again, that could be at the edge, could be in a private cloud, public cloud context or all of the above. So very much an event pipeline view. And remember, the way in which these events are processed and combined and used to drive decisions are not always in a nice time-ordered sequential fashion. You know, as we talked about earlier, events can happen, they can not happen, they may happen, but they may happen out of order, maybe because of a network or system glitch or things like that. So you need to also take into account the fact that these events may come in more of a form of an event cloud not a nice time ordered stream. And so you need to assemble those events in different ways, correlate them in different ways. And then maybe your logic is much more declarative in nature instead of being sequential or procedural, right? So things like event driven rules, um, looking at again, AI ML more in a declarative context, not in a procedural or um, sequential context. Right? These may also be other ways in which you actually wanna process your events. So yes, you may do math on streams, which is your more streaming, streaming analytics world. Um, you may also do math on event clouds, um, which is more of your event processing or contextual declarative form of, of handling of different kinds of events. And this of course may be done in a stateless or stateless or stateful, sorry, fashion. So for example, you need to understand the current state of the entity of which the events are occurring against. So if you have an airplane that's parked at the gate, the way in which events act upon that airplane, the decisions are going to be very different than if the plane is in the air. Right? So the state of that entity is very important so that when you make decisions based on different combinations of events, you're making decisions according to the right state, right, the right context. So many different ways to look at events, many different ways to assemble events, many different ways to think about an architecture that's going to handle events. And, and this is just one picture, right? This is just one example. So, you know, we've looked at this in different ways, but I'm gonna have some API contract. I'm gonna define that contract, push that into my architecture, and then the final, the services and mechanisms that I want to handle and process those events. Um, there's different projects, and there's many, many, many different kinds of frameworks for building out these event-driven architectures and systems. This is one example of an open source project. Of course, people will combine this with service meshes, API gateways, event-driven gateways, um, Kafka, Pulsar, a lot of these other capabilities. There's of course many different ways and technologies that you can put into place to handle uh, events and build these architectures. And of course you can combine them in different ways. So you may look at Kafka as either an event source or an event sync. Pulsar, you can do the same thing, another form of a, uh, effectively an event driven broker, if you will. And, and then as I mentioned, you can put all of this together. So you can have streaming data, event driven data, request reply APIs, event-driven APIs, and you can use this to really augment your overall end-to-end -end enterprise architecture. Okay, so events are important, events are key. Uh, it can be challenging. There's maybe no, you know, not necessarily a, 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 always a, a great answer to how you're gonna build these event-driven architectures, but APIs obviously play a key role here. Um, how you're gonna manage these event-driven uh, endpoints, how you're going to define the contracts, those kinds of things become very important. And of course, you need to understand how to blend those event-driven patterns in with the rest of the ways in which you're building out your architecture. Finally, last slide, um, for anybody that wants to learn more about some of these topics, as well as a number of just general open source topics, 
we do hold an open source community day. This is our uh, second one for the year. Uh, Microsoft, Google, and a number of other organizations are part of this particular community day, purely focused on open source. Events are one concept uh, that'll be covered as our APIs, but also things like augmented reality and some other fun topics as well. So feel free to come and check that out. And with that, I think I uh, see out of the corner of my eye that my time is up. <laughs> Dan, back to you. Yeah, great job, Nelson. Um, we do have a few questions uh, that we have. So uh, WW asked this, say we have two different group of subscribers where each group has five services doing the same thing. And those two groups are subscribing to the same event. How do we ensure only one service in each subscriber group will process the event? <laughs> well, some of that is going to be related to the technology that you're actually subscribing to the events from. So some technologies will allow you to set up consumer groups so that different subscribers within that group, it's essentially only one of them will get it as an example. Uh, so there's different ways that sometimes the, the event, the, the way in which you're moving the events or delivering the events, that technology will actually allow you to set up uh, guidelines, restrictions, things like that on how many consumers can actually process that event. Um, the other, other ways, you know, you get into more trickier circumstances, you know, tracking event IDs and things like that. Um, but that can get, as everybody would know, very ugly very quickly. Um, but in many ways, it's, it's through the technologies that you're actually connected to that can help facilitate event delivery and how many people are processing it and when. Great, thanks. Uh, the next question is from, uh, from the same person, actually, WW, with the event streaming, when subscribers receive an event, does it usually one by one or could it be more at one time? So I think maybe we're talking about batching events. Yeah, it sounds like batching or, I mean, a lot of the ways in which you will process either events um, and you have to look at it in terms of streaming or if it's just, uh, again, uh, more of what I call the event cloud, events aren't necessarily time ordered. For example, if you're dealing with streaming events, you could actually set up time windows or tumbling windows as an example. Um, and the idea is there is that you're collecting a certain set of events. So let's say you're gonna collect the last 10 seconds worth of events or maybe it's count based and you can group it. So let's say it's uh, this number of the last 10 seconds of events for this uh, plane as an example. And of course you're gonna have multiples of those. And then you can perform mathematical functions over those time windows or tumbling windows and so on. And then control whether you want the events to kind of fall off one by one out of that window. Or maybe you just, you know, when the time is up that window tumbles and you empty it and you start all over again. Um, if you're dealing with an event cloud, it may be more based on things like all of the events that occurred within this window correlated um, maybe by some other attributes that aren't necessarily always time bound. So, so yeah, you, you can process them one by one. That's more of a, a simple form of event processing. This happens, so do X. Or you can start to combine and collect combinations of events based on things like time or other attributes. Great, thank you. Uh, another question by Weil Teng. What to know more about the evolution of APIs and beyond? Solace, oh, sorry, hang on. That's uh, That seems to be an ad advertisement, actually. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. There, is one, there is one last question, again, from the same sure. person. You know you. Yep. Uh, what do you use for event pipelines? Sorry, I'm in a meeting, so I might miss if you mentioned it before. Oh, no, no, that's all fine. So the, um, if you're looking at event pipelines, and again, uh, there's open source technologies and commercial technologies that you can use to handle event pipelines. And so if you're dealing with things like streaming, um, then maybe it's something like a, you know, NiFi Flink sort of, you know, if you're looking at open source. And again, I'm not here to make commercials. So, I mean, Tipco has products in this space too, but th there's a number of products that are out there that you can use. You really have to look at the characteristics. Are you looking for more of a streaming where you're handling time ordered what are typically, I mean, you can do a little bit of out of order processing, but that's not the norm in that case. Or are you looking more for this event cloud context? Are you doing it in a more rule driven AI ML style of processing against the different combinations of events? Or are you doing math on streams with time windows and tumbling windows? You need to look at some of these different characteristics and, and that's going to help obviously, I'm not, not saying anything new, but understand your use cases, and it's likely that you're gonna have more than one style of technology. It's very hard to find a one size fits all, at least for something that's optimized for the different ways in which you wanna process events. 
Great. Well, thanks. That was the last question, and which is fortunate because we're out of time. So uh, but thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Helson. That's an awesome presentation. Oh, appreciate it. Enjoy, everyone. Have a good rest of the uh, good rest of the day.